Um, I'm actually going to read a selection of work. Um, I will start with Growing Up With Ghosts. Um, I'm half Punjabi and half Chinese. And um, my father died when I was very, very young. So this, this book is um, an exploration of grief. And um, it's about a little girl who's trying to find her father. So I'll just read from the opening. <clears throat> I remember the day my father stopped singing. Just as he sang me to, he sang me to wake. Wake up, my darling little girl. Your papa is here. Your papa is here. In lilting tones and in different registers, he would sing to me throughout the day and into the night. In the quiet, windowless room of the blue wooden house in Pasir Pute, and in the whiteness of the room in Taiping with sunflowers splashed orange and white curtains, and in the hard, concrete room of Bapuji's house in Penang, where the window panes resembled patterns on my coloring book, the room that smelled of talcum powder and coconut oil, where he last put me to sleep and woke me that day, when we drove in the wide blue car with fins with the windows open, he sang to me while we drove past the Chinese mansions on McAllister Road and onto the winding road with trees that would take us onto the beach on Batu Fringi. He sang when he tickled my wriggling feet and splashed water on my open face, stinging my eyes. I heard him singing as I wandered up away from him to be toweled dry, my face turning again and again to see him waving at me his voice getting fainter and fainter. Don't worry, my darling little girl, your papa is here. Your papa is here. And then the sea came up and swallowed my father. The sea slithered salt, water and sand into his mouth and throat and lungs and his heart. The sea coiled its might around my father and silenced him. I was a child of four and my father never sang to me again. I am Punjabi, a Sardani of the Khalsa, of the pure, from the tenet sprung from the loins of Guru Nanak, from the plains of the Punjab and the wheat fields of Amritsar. I am Chinese from the port city of Canton, from Fatsan, from Lam Soiche, from the village of fishermen and of joystick makers. I had two childhoods, a childhood with my father and a childhood with my mother. This is a love story of how my parents found each other. This is a life story of how I found them and how I found myself. I grew up with ghosts. I grew up with the dead and the voices that resonate. I grew up with myth. I grew up with grief and its untold stories. In Ipoh, in the heart of the Kinta Valley, in the light of pre-war shop houses, cloth merchants and food, of pigs, of slaughter, of tears. I grew up in Penang, in my grandfather Bapuji's house, of snakes and the Grand Saib of my grandfather's typewriter in his white turban. I speak from five voices and I speak from my own. These are our stories. My great grandmother was a witch. She reared snakes, they were white cobras. I was told this as a child. She used to worship the snakes in the village. She was a Naga worshiper. There was a famine in the Punjab and many people died. Her husband died and then her brothers died. Her sons were away in the army and when they returned, she sent them away. She sent them away so they would not suffer the same fate. And the villagers, they banished her. She was a curse, a bad omen. She left her village in Verka, close to Amritsar, and went to live in the caves, close to the border of Kashmir. And there she lived with her snakes. After my father died, I did not know what it meant to be Indian. I grew up Chinese, yearning to be Indian. Death created distance. Chapati sag dal manji bapuji nei. Chapati sag dal manji bapuji nei. Those were the only words I needed to know. Bapuji spoke English. He was a petition writer. My grandmother Manji stayed in the kitchen all the time. She made chai, lots of it. We were the half breeds, the Chinese Punjabi pariahs of Chisman Road, Penang. We drank chai and we felt Indian. My father's death evicted me from the world and now. I write myself back into it. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I'm going to read from my, la my latest book. Um, it's a novel, which is set in Kuala Lumpur um, in 1998, during the Reformasi years where Malaysia was um, um, revolting against 
our Prime Minister at the time, Mahathe Mohamad, who had arrested um, Anwar Ibrahim, who was then the Deputy Prime Minister, um, on allegations of sodomy. <coughs> so it starts in 1998 and ends in 2004, um, and is um, set against the backdrop of the Reformasi years, which are very, very tumultuous years. So I'll read from the prologue in the opening. My name is Delonix Regea. I am named after the most flamboyant of all tropical trees, the flame of the forest. My father, a well-known lawyer and an avid naturalist, had a particular passion for tropical flora and their Latin names. On the day I was born, he planted a seedling in our garden. Today, it stands taller than our house, where the end of the garden meets Gussing Hill, and where the red flowers fall onto the grass like a magical cloak. As a child, I once saw a black cobra weave in and out of the flowers, this glittery black slash easing the crimson cover left and right. I was struck with fright and watched it slither into the leafy green undergrowth and disappear into the jungle. I have long memories of rain, soft tropical showers, majestic thunderous storms and itinerant drizzles, which would come and go for hours and days. The Malaysian monsoon is a vehement creature, powerful and glorious, yet tender enough to soothe one into the most delicious of sleeps. This is how I remember the rains. My childhood came with the rains, and this, my father's garden. Part one, standing in the eyes of the world. Kuala Lumpur, KL, Kuala Lumpur, or Kuala Lumpur, to the white man, the Matsalis. City of sinners and sex, Sodom and Gomorrah. It was 1998, and the city was the party central of Asia, of the world. Drugs had opened up the minds of this one-time placid society and bade in a new revolution, in a time where people hungered for freedom from authoritarian politicians, from the police, from their mindless jobs, from themselves. Ecstasy had hit the town in a way that could be described as monumental. There were Feng Tao clubs in Bukit Bintang, Chiras, and Jinjiang that catered to the Chinese Abings and Aliens, who felt ill at ease in the posh opity bars like Museum and the Backroom Club. There were clubs for the Indian gangsters in Sintol and Slayang. There were dodgy Dangdut clubs on Jalan Ipoh and Brickfields, where the girls would dance with you, get high with you, and then go down on you. There were underground clubs that opened after the ones closed, then stayed open till people had come down from their highs. Dealers were raking it in. MDMA was on everyone's lips and tongues. There was pussy and dick everywhere. Pink, brown, yellow, black. Everybody was high. DJs flew in from all over the world to play to hundreds, no, thousands of people who swallowed pink, blue, white pills. Everybody wanted E. Nobody drank alcohol. Water was the salve for the days and nights on sweaty dance floors. Ecstasy was prayer. Ecstasy was the new God. The great Asian financial crisis was crawling out. Billions were lost, millions gained. The ringgit had been pegged at 380 against the US dollar. It saved us. Our ASEAN neighbors didn't fare so well. The Petronas Twin Towers were finally complete. The towering phallic monstrosities had transformed the city. And there were stories that bled upon stories for fodder. It was the topic of conversation at every dinner table, every mamak stall, every kopitiam between Bangsa and Churras. How ugly it was, how, how sterile, how unkeal, how western. Ayo, so sci-fi, like Gotham City, so ugly la. Chilaka betol, chilaka, chilaka, cursed, cursed to never be built. Before the towers, the site was the turf club, built by the British because they knew the land was unsafe for any structure taller than a coconut tree. Underneath the turf was a network of limestone caves. To build the world's tallest twin structures above hollow caves was an act of folly, of utter stupidity. It was a disaster in the making. Mahathir's twin pricks, that's what they were. A sign that Malaysia had come into its own, that we had arrived that our quest to have the world's tallest flagpole, its longest beef murtabak, and the biggest mall in Asia had succe succeeded, and that Malaysians had something, finally, something to be proud of. 
These towers, designed by a New Yorker of Argentinian descent and built by rival Japanese and Korean engineering companies, were to pump millions upon millions of tons of concrete into miles of limestone caves, had validated our feeling that Malaysia had arrived. Never mind that it was built by thousands of Bangladeshi and Indonesian workers, slaving away on meager wages, some of whom had been crushed to death in hushed up accidents, that they died senselessly like frogs, mati kata, for another notch in our country's race to become a first world nation by looking like a first world nation. The towers loomed over KL, a new symbol for the city, like the Sears Tower, like the Empire State Building. We had come to be defined by two 88-story shards of concrete, aluminum, gas, and steel, two towering octagons inspired by sacred Islamic geometry. From distant suburbs to the Golden Triangle, the Twin Towers rose above everything else, flanked K Tower, now dwarfed and comical with its pink shaft. This was engineering at its best. This was the strongest steel in the world, capable of withstanding tremors because its steel beams could bend under pressure. The newly built Bukit Jalil sports complex was sprawled out and ready for the Commonwealth Games. Malaysians were gearing up for the world stage. Our time had come to show the world that we were capable, that Malaysia bole, yes we can, that we had arrived. In September, everything changed. On the 2nd of September, Malaysia's Deputy Prime Minister Anwar Ibrahim was sacked by Mahathir Mohamad the dictatorial authoritarian prime minister who had ruled for 17 years. On the 11th of September, the Commonwealth Games opened with no expense spared, fireworks, pomp and circumstance. Ella, the pint-sized Malaysian songstress, performed the theme song of the games, standing in the eyes of the world, with smoldering black eyeliner and poor diction, I hope you enjoy, to screaming multitudes. On the 20th of September, Anwar Ibrahim was arrested. On the 29th of September, he appeared in court with a black eye. Malaysia, the beloved country of my birth, would never be the same again. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm Felicia Yap, and this is my debut thriller. Yesterday, this is the American edition, which is published uh, in North America, Canada. Um, and this is the British edition. It's uh, also published elsewhere in the Commonwealth, like in Australia and New Zealand. Um, so um, I'm in the process of being translated into these 13 languages. So, so far we've got um, French, um, Italian just came out, um, German and Malay. So my dream is to be translated into Malayalam someday, and that'd be wonderful. So what is yesterday about? Um, it's actually a story, a, a thriller, set in a world where most people only remember one day, which is yesterday. So in a world where everyone has limited memory, can you really hope to understand the truth when a murder happens? So just to give you a rough idea of the story, um, the body of a woman, a beautiful woman, is found in a river, River Cam in Cambridge. And suspicion falls on the man she had been sleeping with, Mark, and his wife, Claire. But can you really hope to catch a killer when everybody who's involved can only remember yesterday, a day or two? And that includes the detective who's working on the case. So that's the premise of um, yesterday. And I really wanted it to be a love story too, because can you really hope to love someone if you only remember one day? So the book looks at that question too. Um, and I was, when I was writing this, I really wanted the book to hold up a mirror to all of us, to how we ourselves make memories and what we choose to remember or forget. And connected with this is our own capacity for self-delusion, the very slippery nature of our memories. Because studies suggest that 80% of what we remember isn't actually what happened. So when you think about ourselves and how we ourselves choose to remember the past, um, you know, um, can, can these people who actually don't remember hope to know themselves? So in, in the world of yesterday, people um, keep track of what happened to them um, by writing in electronic diaries at the end of each day. 
So they read these diaries the next day, the next morning, um, and they try to memorize what's happened to them. So with that, I wanted this book to hold up a mirror to our own capacity um, for, or rather our own dependency on various forms of media, um, on Google searches, on Wikipedia searches, um, to hold on to the past. And actually studies suggest that these um, technological advances is actually paradoxically affecting our own memories. Um, so because we're so dependent on them and so reliant, um, it's actually affecting our own uh, reliance, uh, our own uh, ability to remember. Um, so I wanted to look at that two things. Um, and the last thing is just a simple question of love, the triangular relationship between memory, hatred, and love. So the villain in this book um, says that um, hatred may well be the sum total of accumulated grievances. But it goes back to what about love? What is love if we don't remember? So that's the three things I wanted really to explore in this, in this thriller. So I'll start um, by reading from chapter zero. A village near Cambridge, two years before the murder. Let me tell you a couple of horrible secrets. I'll start by showing you a photograph. This is me a long time ago. I had a flat, chat, ch flat chest and protruding ears. If you look closely, you can see that I once had hope in my eyes and fire in my soul. Today, both the hope and the fire are gone, wiped out by years of institutionalization. Here's a second photograph. Oh, I see you flinching. That's understandable. It is, after all, a photograph of you. You're a mugshot taken recently. You don't look too bad here. Blonde hair cascading down your shoulders, impressive tits. Guess what? I'm going to transform myself so I'll look exactly like you. I'm going to bleach my hair and get boobs like yours. Is that a frown I see in your forehead? You don't get it, do you? You're wondering why would I want to look like you? Let me explain. I remember everything. Really, I do. I'm the only person in this world who remembers her past. All of it. Mostly in vivid detail. I'm not kidding. And that makes me pretty damn special. You don't believe me, do you? That's understandable too. Like the five billion moments around us, you only remember what happened yesterday. You wake up each morning with facts in your head. Carefully curated information about yourself and other people. You stagger from your bed to your eye diary on your gleaming kitchen counter. To that electronic device of yours, your meager lifeline to the past. Desperate to learn the few pitiful details you've wrote down the night before eager to add them to your memories of what happened yesterday and to the other cold, sterile facts of what you've learned about yourself. Pretty rubbish, isn't it? And you're even used to it, aren't you? Because you've been doing it since the age of 18, after your hatless little brain switched itself off. No wonder you're envious of the duos whose short-term memories are slightly better than yours. But you're all the same, equally pathetic. Let me add a simple truth, since you're getting to know the real me. When you remember everything, you recall what other people have done to you, even if they don't. Down to the smallest, most gruesome detail, which causes you to desire vengeance if they've hurt you bad, like really, really bad. Like say, if they cause you to end up in a mental asylum for 17 years. It makes you yearn during the darkest hours of the night when the moon's smile has faded and the owls have fallen silent to set matters straight. When you remember everything, you will also get away with everything, like revenge, for instance. Fucking convenient, isn't it? This is precisely why I, Sophia Elisa Eiling, will get away with it. Vengeance would be nice, especially in view of what you've done to me. 
all the terrible little things you've been guilty of over the years. I recall each and every one of them. It's the sum total of remembered grievances that makes hatred potent. Oh yes, the act of revenge will be easy because no one will remember what I'm going to do to you except for me. So that's my villain, Sophia. She begins the book. And um, the, the book is uh, told from the perspectives of uh, the four characters I mentioned. So that's Sophia. And then the next chapter, chapter one, which is to Claire, um, which is the wife of the, the man who's been sleeping with Sophia. Um, so I'll read a little bit from Claire, chapter one. A man is whimpering in the kitchen. He's also blocking my way to the marble counter where my eye diary lies. It's diode still flashing electric purple. I squint. He's clutching his left hand and wincing in pain. Blood is dripping from his forefinger. He's surrounded by the remains of a teapot. What happened, I ask. It slipped, he says, his mouth taking on a stricken line. Let me have a look, I say, stepping around ceramic shards. As I move toward him, the gold ring on his left hand mocks me with a sharp glint. It causes the main facts I've learned about my husband over the years to spin back to mine. Name, Mark Henry Evans, age 45, occupation, novelist hoping to be the next MP for South Cambridgeshire. We got married at 12.30 p.m. on 30th September 1995 in the Chapel of Trinity College. Nine people attended our wedding. Mark's parents had to refuse to come. I promised Chaplain Waltons that I would tell myself each morning that I love Mark. The cost of the wedding was £678.29. We last had sex more than two years ago at 22.34 on 11 January 2013. He was done in six and a half minutes. I haven't yet worked out if this multiple facts I've retained about my husband should make me feel bad, sad, or mad. Try to catch it mid fall, says Mark, but it bounced off the dishwasher. I study the gash on his forefinger. It's almost an inch long. I lift my eyes to Mark's face, taking in the heavy creases above his brow. The troubled wrinkles fanning up from the corners of his eyes. His twisted lips. I remember him tossing about in bed last night as if he were being pursued by something in his dreams. Looks nasty, I say. I'll get a plaster. Turning my back on him, I hurry up the stairs. Fact, the first aid kit is stored in the cabinet next to the bathroom mirror. Before I reach up, I pause in front of my reflection. The eyes staring back at me are different from the haunted eyes I saw yesterday. Today's face has clearer pupils, yet cheeks are swollen. The skin around its eyes are puffy. I cried myself to sleep last night. I spent most of the day in bed. I wonder why. I stare hard at the distended image in the mirror, willing the relevant facts to come to my head. But the reasons behind yesterday's misery are flitting beyond reach, like the wings of an elusive butterfly. I only remember hiding, sobbing into my pillow, and refusing to eat. I grimace in defeat. The face in the mirror frowns back at me. Yesterday's unhappiness must have been caused by something that happened two days ago. But what? I don't recall what happened the day before yesterday. Because I can't. I only remember what happened yesterday. So I'll stop here. <laughs> So just, just to wrap up uh, my, my reading, I, I just wanted to say that um, I'll be signing copies of um, yesterday um, up at um, the bookshop right after the session. So if any of you are interested in getting copy, um, do, do head off up to the Grove. Um, and um, I just wanted to say that um, yesterday really um, 
is a, a thriller about the lies we tell ourselves, uh, masquerading at mem as memories. Because if we only remember yesterday, suppress secrets and old wounds, like, you know, revenge, take on chilling new meaning. And love certainly takes on new meaning in a new way. So I really hope that yesterday is a book you won't forget. Thank you so much. Thank <laughs> you.